So welcome to the third uh, Liz Elliott Memorial Lecture and Dialogue. This is, we started these uh, several years ago in honor of, of Liz Elliott, who was a, an associate professor at SFU and one of the founding members of the Center for Restorative Justice uh, at SFU. And we hope to uh, continue the, the tradition of having these at least once a year um, around about this time. So our speaker um, this afternoon is Karen Joseph, who's the Executive Director of Reconciliation Canada. But before uh, we begin, before we move to the proceedings, um, I'd just like to hand over to Mr. Seaweed, who will uh, offer us an opening discourse. Hi there, uh, my name is Dave Seaweed. I am the Aboriginal Coordinator at Douglas College. I've been in this position now for about 12 years. I'm excited to see so many of you here and a number of my students. Of course, they said something about getting 5% mark or some sort of grade for being here, so that's a bit embarrassing. But uh, I have the opportunity on behalf of Chief Rhonda Larrabee of the Kakite First Nation and the New Westminster Band to welcome you all here onto the Kakite Territory and to the Coast Salish Territories. Uh, my background in history is uh, Quaigil from Port Hardy Alert Bay. And uh, I view, we view Douglas College as kind of being one nation because we have probably representatives of over 300. So it's an honor and privilege to welcome you here because the Kakite Nation is a nation that was all about gathering the people from the river to tell stories, uh, to share food, and to be part of nature. So on behalf of Douglas College and the Kakite Territory, I welcome you. I hope you enjoy the event, and thanks for having me. My name is Glenn Patterson. Um, uh, I'm currently working uh, at the um, at Matsqui Institution. It's a medium institution out in the Fraser Valley up in Abbotsford, and I work there as a uh, the title they give me is an elder slash spiritual advisor, and uh, so I, I work with uh, mainly Aboriginal inmates, although we're, we're not allowed to discriminate, so I have other inmates that come to work with me as well. Um, I, I, was, uh, I was asked to, uh, um, to say a prayer, and I was going to sing it, I was going to do a little bit of a prayer and then uh, sing a song. I'd like to share the song with you, but um, my background is my, my, uh, my mom's family are all... Um, all from the British Isles, they're Irish, English, Scottish, going back a few hundred years. My dad's side of the family are Mohawks from Ontario. They're from a place called Tyndanaga, Mohawk Territory, and it's, in, um, it's near uh, Belleville, Ontario. It's, uh, we're also known as the, the Bay of Quinty Mohawks. So. Um, I asked permission of a friend of mine who's also involved with the, the Kikite Nation, uh, if I could have permission to sing a song in his territory. So. I, just wanted to, uh, my good friend up here had talked about, uh, talked about what the Kikite meant. He, he had told me that it means a meeting place. So here we are. We're getting a chance to meet here and, and gather this way. So um, I asked permission to sing that song. So here I am, a, a half Mohawk, and I'm going to sing a Dakota song <laughs> in, in Kikite territory. <laughs> so uh, I hope I'm covering myself here. Because, because there's a, a, a culture and, uh, and uh, ownership of songs and different things can get, can, it, it, protocol can get quite tricky. It can be quite tricky, so I hope I've covered everything and uh, my, 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 my being here today, I hope that I don't offend anybody. So, um, I'll, uh, I'll offer this song. It's a, it was a, this song was taught to me by uh, Calvin Pompana from Sioux Valley, Manitoba. So we're, getting a, we're covering a lot, of, a lot of places around Turtle Island here. Um, but just before I, I, I sing that song, it's, a, it's an eagle song, and the song basically talks about that, that young eagle. That's that eagle before it's four years old. It's called, a, they call that one in Dakota, Wambadi Hadeshka. And so the Wambadi's an eagle, Hadeshka means spots. And so that song is, is sung, uh, the, bir the, the birds basically saying, me first, me first, the one that flies the day. So it's, it's, it's when we have these gatherings, we get together and we, and we gather this way. Sometimes these birds will come. Um, the mother of my children, who's Haida, um, is, is uh, 
um, she says they come because they think there might be food there. <laughs> you get a lot of people gather around, you know, there could be some food. So those young birds are curious. So, um, so I sing that song also to honor everybody here, particularly the students that are here. You know, it's uh, uh, it, 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 with those birds, um, only one in five gets to, gets, to be, gets to have a white head, and that's after about five years. And uh, when there's, there's two birds born in the nest, one gets kicked out by the older one. So the, it's only one, really one in 10 gets to have that white, that white hair. So, so this is about that bird that, that comes before that. <clears throat> I ask that um, we all draw our minds together and we all focus on, on, uh, on the, uh, the things that we're going to hear and we're going to see and that uh, we're all able to bring something away with us. Uh, the, a beautiful thing is going to happen here. Some good things are going to happen and you're going to learn things. You're going to see things and hear things and that we can all take something away with us. Take something inside and you'll take it back and share it with your families. Oh. Thank you very much, Glenn. That was beautiful. And speaking of families, I'd also like to acknowledge Liz's family that's here today. Um, Milt and her brother Peter, all the way from Ottawa, and her children, Chris and Maya. Just thanks so much for coming. It really means a lot to us. My name is Brenda Morrison. I'm the director of the Center for Restorative Justice at Simon Fraser University. And it's my great honor to um, recognize some hummingbirds amongst us. So as I look into the audience, I see many, many hummingbirds. People doing remarkable work with courage and compassion in their own communities. And many of them, as I see you here, were mentored by Dr. Liz Elliott. She was a hummingbird. She was an inaugural hummingbird here at Simon Fraser University. Um, and each and every one of you is making a difference in your own communities. To be a hummingbird is to declare yourself to the values and the relationships that nurture and sustain healthy communities. 
In other words, is to declare yourself to the values that build restorative justice. Liz Elliott invited each of us to declare ourselves to this vision in the last chapter of her book, Security with Care. This particular chapter opens with the parable of the hummingbird. The hummingbird with courage and compassion, tenacity, drop by drop, saved something that was special to her, saved the forest, saved her home. Well, Liz Elliott asked us to declare ourselves to the values that build healthy communities, the values of restorative justice, and she declared herself to many, many communities. She was well-loved in many circles. But there was one circle that was particularly important to her, and that circle meets every week at Ferndale Institution. Last week, I had the honor to spend some time with this community. It was this community that Liz gathered strength and wisdom and courage during some very difficult times, but also some very important times that grounded her. So I wanted to pass on some of their wisdom to you. This is what they told me when I was there last week. They want you to know that Liz's legacy at Ferndale lives on, that the faces might change, but the legacy is still strong. Liz was a shining example of how community should be. They asked you and us to believe in the power of the circle, the power of the circle to create community and to care for the circle and care for each other. They asked us to build hopeful communities with each other and in our own lives and to never take that hope away. And they asked us each to be a hummingbird and to do what we can, as the parable spells out. And today, I'm really honored to say that a community, actually a few communities here in British Columbia, have recognized um, the spirit of two humming, hummingbirds. And I'm, we're going to honor them here today and we'll do the same next year and every year because we have many hummingbirds to declare. The inaugural 2013 recipients of the SFU Hummingbird Award model, strive, demonstrate, build, and enable the spirit of restorative justice in more ways than I can tell. Like all good work, their vision and commitment began around a kitchen table with a, little, with a few good friends, some good food, and maybe a little good wine. Today, after decades of commitment to this vision, through commitment to dialogue, through commitment to research, to commitment to a better world, <clears throat> they have produced a series of educational videos that are now some of the most utilized <clears throat> resources on restorative justice nationally and internationally. They have not only influenced communities here in British Columbia, they have influenced communities in Australia, in all over North America, in South America, in every single continent. So in that way, their vision has expanded from here in British Columbia to around the world. They are truly deserving to be our inaugural Hummingbird recipients. You might know who I'm talking about. <laughs> and we are very happy that these inaugural recipients call British Columbia home. So we can honor them here today and in terms of the communities that they have served and have declared them hummingbirds. I would like to invite Larry Moore and Kathy Douglas to join us. Go. I have to say a few words. So, um, we have we um, a, a few months ago, the John Howard Society approached us. The John Howard Society um, is across Canada. They serve many communities as well, and uh, they they wanted to honor Liz as well because Liz also served on the board. And uh, one other board member said, "Let's create a, a legacy." 
a legacy, a tangible legacy for this award. So I'm honored that the John Howard Society is partnering with the Center for Restorative Justice. So we have this legacy award that honors both Glary and Kathy. It's wonderful that you, and so fitting that you are the inaugural recipients. It all started around Liz's table, as I've been told many times, and your legacy lives on. And we also have a beautiful perpetual one that will sit in the Center for Restorative Justice, and your plaque will be the first one right underneath the lip. So <clears throat> congratulations. Thank you so much. We'll move now to hear from our keynote speaker, uh, Karen Joseph. That's you. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Hagela Kasla Nasnamuyu Nugu Am Kunwatagilis Sat Sant Ma Quid Quen Quiligeti. Greetings to all of you who are one with me. My name is uh, Karen Joseph. My English name is Karen Joseph. I'm the eldest daughter of uh, Chief Dr. Robert Joseph, who is a, a hereditary chief of the Kwa'enok First Nations, um, located on, actually it's on the mainland, just, just uh, northern tip of Vancouver Island across. And uh, we come from, from some really small and isolated communities. and. Uh, <clears throat> and I was really honored to, to be asked to come and speak here today. Um, mostly because the family is here. Uh, because I think when we do the work, we're, we're tasked with the responsibility of, of carrying on the messages and and the work of, of the people we love, and we know the spirit in which they did that work, then that's a big responsibility to, to be asked to do. And, and to be here with the inaugural recipients of, of this important <coughs> award um, is, is uh, high praise indeed. Um, because it's really easy to, to be a leader, sh leader within uh, external eyes, hold positions of power and influence and decision making and resources. It's another thing to be held in esteem by your children. It's, an, it's another thing to know that that leadership extends beyond how you're perceived in the outside world and continues into your own families and how you're received by your own families. And my father is, is one of those people, and I'm next in line, which is why I'm here today, to, to come and speak to you and, and to carry on some of the traditions of, of the work that he does. And uh, <clears throat> and I had a really, this is a really, I speak all the time, and, and I don't uh, normally have an issue with it. But I think that um, justice is one of those things that impacts our people so profoundly on a, on a daily basis. Um, and when we talk in particular about correctional practice, and, and you as, as future leaders of that practice, as future designers of that practice, as future implementers of that practice are critically important to how we change the world going forward. And so, although some of you, as, as uh, Dave mentioned, are here for your 5%, um, as Glenn mentioned, when the words are spoken from the heart and, and, and from the spirit, uh, you can't help but be changed by that. So I, I really appreciate all of you for being here and for being willing to listen today. To give you an idea of, of who I am, um, actually even, even before I do that, I, I wanted to uh, really acknowledge Glenn for the 
song that you sang to, to open it up and, and to remind me of uh, the messaging that we have when we do, when we do this work. And, and uh, Dave, for, for clearing the way to welcome us to the territories here and, and making sure that um, all of that is settled, because those are really critical traditions within our people. Um, it's akin to walking into somebody's house and, and thinking you have a right to sit down at the table without them even being invited. <laughs> so, so it's really, it's really important. Um, when I think about restorative justice and I think specifically about um, Liz Elliott's work, I keep thinking about the the restoration of people to dignity and to and to their God-given talents. When I first started this um, work with Reconciliation Canada, uh, my father was. Um, I don't I don't know if many of you know him, but his his English name is Chief Dr. Robert Joseph, and. Um, he has worked with the Indian Residential School file for probably 16 years. He's a survivor himself from the age of six to the age of uh, 18, as is my mother. So um, that means that the horrors that they experience there are passed <laughs> from generation to generation. And that's really some of the work that we're talking about here today is about how do those behaviors and those patterns get passed from generation to generation and how do they impact us as a society. And Reconciliation Canada arose because of his desire to recognize what Liz was talking about, Namwayut. Namwayut means we are all one. It means all my relations. But in today's society, it, it's a real flippant term it's a poor translation in English. And what Namwayut actually means, if you ever do the work, what we call the work in our big house, in our traditional houses, and if you know anything about culture, and if you know any, just think family, but just on a huge scale, sibling rivalry, I want this, no, she got that, that's not fair, blah, blah, that all goes on, but just like supersize it, right? And. Um, but what we're doing in those places when we have our traditions and our potlatches is we're giving somebody identity. We're giving them a name. We're saying you belong. We're saying we're acknowledging you for the unique gifts that you carry. Not all of us are the best singers. Not all of us are the best dancers. Not all of us are the best speakers. But some of us, like me, I'm one heck of an organizer. So I can sit there in the background and go, we need some water. Help that elder to the bathroom. You guys are too slow. <laughs> you know, I can just, and I'm one of those aunties that everybody, oh, oh here she comes. <laughs> That's my gift. That's what I do. You know, my dad couldn't uh, organize himself out of his closet if, we didn't, <laughs> if he didn't have some of us around helping him. But he's brilliant at what he does. And so one of the things that we do in those traditional ceremonies is you watch young children grow up. You, you'll see them. Some are rowdy. They bounce off the walls. They're crazy. And they're just so energetic. They say hi to everybody else. And then others are really, really shy. And they sit at home. And they, they kind of giggle. And when their laugh comes out, they're just like the best laughter in the whole world because, you know, it's a genuine soul. So they're clearly different little individuals, even when they're young. <laughs> And so we watch them as we grow and we, we see what's your natural thing that you're good at. It's almost like if you know anything about leadership, strength-based leadership, you know, where rather than spending time, a whole bunch of time trying to get good at the things you really are terrible at, you spend a whole bunch of time trying to get super good at the things that you're just naturally talented at. And, and that's how you sort of achieve your purpose and, and joy in life. That's kind of how we do it in the big house. But while we're doing that, there's all of the politics that go on. There's all of the little rivalries. There's cross-nation rivalries. There's, there's different religious practices. That's not the way you do the dance. That's not the right word for the song. Oh, that prayer wasn't done properly. You didn't do blah, blah. All this stuff happens. 
which is why before we start any of our work, we always say every chief in our big house before the first words out of their mouth when they're greeting everybody is Hagela Kesla Nath Namwayut. Welcome to all of you who are one with me. Which means that we bring our highest selves to the table for the purpose of the work we're doing here today. We put aside our politics, we put aside our ego, we put aside our family difference, we put aside our religious practices, we put aside, put aside all of those things that create barriers between us and live our highest purpose, our highest selves, so that we can move forward together in a good way for our children and for our grandchildren. There comes a time in life when it becomes not about you and it becomes about what are you willing, what kind of legacy do you want to leave for your children? because that's where true leadership comes in. And you're, many of us in here are young enough yet to just be embarking and touching on figuring out what it is we're really, really good at. And it's a very important journey because the way you practice justice or corrections or any of those other things is going to definitely impact who you become as a human being. And it's not about what the other people think, it's about yourself and, and how you live when you put your head, head on your pillows at night. And so that's a really important thing for, for me and, and how we move forward. One of the things that we realized really, really early on was that Aboriginal people bring to the table a very unique skill. And that is we know how to do circles like no other culture knows how to do circles. Right? Because we do this all the time. This is just what we do. It's just common nature. You just live that way. You don't think any other way other than circles if you're raised within our cultures and within our traditions. So that's the gift we bring. And we bring that practice of namwiyut. It's not something we learned. It's just something you do. It just is what it is. And, um, <clears throat> and so that's what we bring to the table. But we also recognize that we're also not the only people that has suffered challenges throughout life, that everybody at some point in life faces obstacles, faces something really big that they don't know whether they're going to be able to get through. And we use different coping mechanisms based on how we've been raised to get through that. So I was a really shy person and, and I was First Nations when it wasn't a cool time at all to be First Nations and uh, as a young person. And so my escape was education. So I was the smartest, most attentive, kindest, young little Indian girl you could ever be because I knew that was my safe place. If I was smart, then nobody could call me a stupid Indian. If I behaved properly, you know, all of the things that, we, that you learned, all of the, what do you call it, the stereotypes that people grew up with. We grew up with too. We just put them inside and tried to live around them, tried to live in spite of them. And so that was my coping mechanisms. Other people cope in different ways. And so, but the, the, thing, the thing that makes the difference between us as cultures, bringing us all together, is that if we bring all those people together that have challenges in their life, not with the purpose of saying, oh, my trauma was more detrimental than yours was, but looking at this is how we coped. This is the skills that we built within our cultures. And if we can weave those skills together, then we can create some resilience and some commonality that's never existed before. So Reconciliation Canada started with this idea of bringing together people of Aboriginal ancestry, survivors of the Indian Residential School, uh, survivors of the Holocaust, both first generation and multi generational, survivors of the Chinese head tax, the Japanese internment, all of the major apologies that have gone on in the creation of this grand country of ours, and said, let's talk about what does reconciliation mean to you. Because reconciliation, like restorative justice, is a big word. So we needed to make sure that we knew what we were talking about so that. People don't, I mean, because no, there's lots of words about reconciliation. There's theological reconciliation. There's legal reconciliation of rights and title. There's, there's reconciliation of your account, 
account balances. There's all different kinds of reconciliation. So we wanted to make sure that we <coughs> defined a term which ended up, for us, for me as a Kwakwakwak woman, ended up being Namoyut, we are all one. That, was, that transcended across cultures and language groups. So we started by bringing 13 different language groups together, elders of 13 different language groups across the world, and had them come and talk about reconciliation. Reconciliation Canada came about uh, as a vision of my father who, who had been a survivor of the Indian Residential School and recognized the idea of Namoyut, that each of us are born inherently with a, with a gift by definition of our, hum our humanity. We all have something special to contribute to the world. And that's essentially what we do in our circles. That's what we do in our traditions, is look to explore what are those gifts? What are those intrinsic things that, that we can bring to the table? And how do we link them together? And when we do that, how do we link them together so that all of our children, regardless of where they come from, are able to achieve their optimum potential? Because one of the biggest things that we're missing in our society, in Canadian society, and especially through the correctional, the legal systems and, and the, the intrinsic things that go on here, are all of, the, all of this potential, all of these people that mostly went astray because of where they came from, not because of who they are intrinsically as human beings. Now, I don't know how many here know about, know, have heard a story from a survivor about Indian residential schools. Not read it, but actually heard an Indian residential school survivor. A good portion of you. So how many have not? Okay, so it's about half and half. That's pretty good. That's a, that's a good crew, actually. Um, <clears throat> I want you to think for a minute what kind of parent you would be if this was your experience for 11 years of your childhood. So my parents were forcibly removed from their reserves when they were six years old. Uh, they never, for the most part, saw their parents again, so they didn't go back home for Christmas break, or they didn't go home for summer, or they, didn't, they didn't live far, but, but you were given a number. My mother actually remembers her number, 6-6. Six, six. <clears throat> and, um, and so when you're, when, even if you came to the school to pick up your child on those breaks, you would have to know the number. But of course, nobody spoke English, and we didn't use that system. So you couldn't actually ask for your child by the number that they were called to, because number one, you didn't know it, number two, you don't, who calls their children a number, and, and all of these other things, right? So, so that was the first part. But more importantly, besides the fact that you weren't, you know, you were beaten, you were, had the experiments done on you, you, you know, over 50% of the students went in there, died in there because of malnutrition, there was, there was all kinds of uh, death and, and things that, that went on in those schools. Um, sexual abuse, physical abuse, humiliation, torture, um, all of that for 11 years of your life. As a matter of fact, and I didn't know this, I've, I've heard the stories, I've been through the IAP process. One of the things that I just found out recently was that that was the only touch that was ever permitted during the 11 years of those, them being in school. You could not physically touch the child unless you were beating the crap out of them. Children could not touch one another. Imagine raising a dog without ever touching the dog, and the only time you ever touched the dog was to kick the crap out of it. So these little kids are raised this way for all of these years throughout the school, taught they were stupid, taught they were garbage, taught they had no I mean, the, the whole purpose of the school, if you read the documentation, and, and the famous quote is, uh, to kill the Indian in the child. That's, that's why they, they were not permitted to, to uh, 
engage with the heathen influences of their parents or communities because they needed to kill the Indian in the child. And so apartheid in South Africa was actually based on the Indian Act in Canada. Uh, the difference between apartheid in South Africa was when they created the shanty towns and they separated everybody, they did, the South African government refused to take the step of removing the children from the heathen influences of their communities or families. And so apartheid in South Africa failed because you can still pass those legacies on to your children. The Indian Act in, in uh, Canada was very, very successful. Uh, you have many uh, multi-generational people. Don't know who their parents were, don't know where they came from. They know they're brown. They know they're Indian. You can't escape being an Indian person, even if you're not an Indian person. You know, if you're wandering around and you kind of look like you might, you're really sure, oh yeah, I'm part Chinese and I'm part white. No, I'm not Indian. Oh, I'm part Spanish and I'm part blah, blah, not Indian. Just so long as you're not that right, when you're growing up. Because if you're Indian, then you're what? All of the other stereotypes that, that comes along from that. And you certainly must be if you don't know where you're coming from. <laughs> so, so you get it from both sides. But there's these generations of, of ideologies that keep us separate from one another. And I think that as we're going forward, and as we're thinking about who do we want to become as a society, we have to first understand our history. Why are we here today? Why are our institutions, despite less than 5% of the population, more than 50% of Aboriginal people are the ones that are being incarcerated in these institutions? Did you know that the number of, the number of children in care today exceeds any number, any proportion of population across this country that ever went to residential school? So that was when the government legally had the right to go in and run in and literally take children off the ground. You didn't have to ask, there was no due course, due process, whatever. They talk about, you know, hearing the, there's a certain boat that, you know, when, it's like when you see a police car running up the road, right? It's like, oh yeah, it's a ghost car, right? I know what that is. Everybody ditches, right? It's like that back in the day, but it was a certain boat that police people used to come up the river. So everybody would run and ditch and hide the children so that they wouldn't take the kids. And if you weren't strong enough, then you fell out of the tree or you sneezed when you were under the floorboards or you whatever. And then they just swooped down and got the whole lot of you and you never saw your parents again. And so <clears throat> when we're thinking about all of these things and we're thinking about how does it impact us today and how does restorative justice play into this? So we have parents that spent the majority of their life, the only time they ever were touched was to be beaten. The other thing that the residential schools were really, really consciously trying to do was to teach Indian Aboriginal, I, I use the word Indian because that's what we're called under the act. Aboriginal is a nice friendly term that we use today to try to be inclusive of those that are status and non-status and Métis and all of these other things. But the reality is we were all called Indians back in the day when all of this was, was in play. And so what they did was they, <clears throat> would, would, I want you to think about trying to then turn around and parent somebody. You're 18 years old. You've been separated from your families. You've been taken from your parents. You don't know your language. You can't even go back home because now you don't speak the same language anymore. You don't know the cultures. You've, you've missed all of the rights that give you, like, I know what my name is. I know what my responsibility is. I know what my gift is. I know where I belong. I know everything about who I am and how I'm supposed to interact with the world but now I'm this other thing. So the only thing you want to do is recreate family. Let's fall in love and have babies and then everything will be okay. Because all you really want is family. Except you have no clue how to parent. Force, what was it called? 
corporal punishment. Indian men were terrible at take, telling their women what to do. If you know any of us, I'm a Kwakwakiwak woman. You know, you're a Haida woman and a Mohawk man. I'm sorry, but. <laughs> Matrilineal and patrilineal, that's just designed for disaster, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, <clears throat> but I, I want you to, th to think about those things and how are you going to parent yourselves. All of you, you know, you get to a certain age and it's like, oh, God, I'm doing what my dad did. Even when you hate the fact that your dad does that and then you wake up one day and you realize, oh, God, that's what I do. And those are the things you're conscious of. Think about the things that you're unconscious of. About There's this one story I heard this woman, woman say about, oh, yes, we got to have ham for dinner or something like this. We're, we're having ham for dinner. And this is like, so the girl cuts off the end of the ham and says, well, why do you cut off? You know, you know a ham comes with a flat side and then the bunchy side, right? It looks all nasty. So the lady cuts off the end of the ham while they're cooking dinner. And so her partner goes, well, why are you cutting off the end of the ham? I don't know. That's just the way you cook ham. That's what my mother always did. So I just cook ham the same way my mother always cooked ham. And you've got to cut that end off, right? OK. Must be because it's moist or something. I mean, there's got to be some rational reason for why you would cut that piece off. She goes, OK, I'm going to find out. So she talks to her mom. Mom, why do you cut the piece of the ham off? Oh, because uh, my grandmother cut the piece of the ham off. So you know, that's how we always do it. That's how I do it. And so that's how you do it. And, okay. Mom, could you ask Grandma why we do this? Okay. Grandma, why do you cut the piece of the ham off the end of your, the end of the ham off the thing? And she goes, oh, because my pan's not big enough. And so I just cut it off and then the ham fits in there. <laughs> it's got nothing to do with how tasty the ham is, but we just do the things that we're taught because that's what our parents do, right? So, you know, that's a really funny thing that, that we learn as we go, just familial traits that we do. We do strange things because that's what our parents do. Who knows? But take the reverse of that, the negative pieces of that, and we do that because that's what our parents do. Keep your mouth shut. I don't want to hear you. I don't want to talk to you. You're not listening to me. You're being disrespectful. You ought to be picking up your socks. You didn't, you know. And keep in mind that when these guys cleaned, if you're actually, you have kind of, this is a real stereotype, but it actually has to do with residential school. If, if you know people that come from residential schools, you have two kinds of people, two kinds of families, because they either completely reject it or they completely embrace it. So if you ever go into an Aboriginal home, they're either a hot mess or they're pristine. Because when you were in school, you were, you were taught to clean. Women were taught to clean. You were judged by how clean you could get a bathroom with a toothbrush. And we're not talking your average everyday bathroom. We're talking, you know, those old school bathrooms with the bazillion little tiles all the way up the walls and 15 cubicles on both sides with toilets everywhere with a toothbrush. And you got beat or not beat depending on how clean you could get it with that toothbrush. And so many of our mothers and grandmothers are either really, really clean because they were good and they got praised in that and they got some validity for how good an Indian they were by virtue of how clean their health was, house was, or the opposite. I'm never going to be clean. I'm going to hell anyway, so why bother? I have a, a younger brother who when we, we used to have to go, we're a second generation, we used to have to go to, to uh, church because of course my parents went to residential school and so now we have to go to church because, because we're all heathens. That's, if you're an Indian, you're a heathen. And so unlike everybody else who's born into the world who says, uh, I go to church so that I can achieve the sanctity of the creator and enter through the pearly gates and blah, 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 you just basically have to be good and you'll get through the pearly gates. Aboriginal people are born heathens, according to the doctrine, because we're considered non-persons by, under the law, through the Indian Act. And so you're automatically a heathen. And so you must go to church in hope of one day achieving that. 
And so just think about the way that you would grow up in life if instead of being loved and nurtured and a special child and somebody with a gift and something like this, you were automatically doomed to failure. And this is what you're taught. How do you reconcile those two views of who you are? And so we have all of these histories that go on. And then the anger and the frustration as you get older, when you start realizing, uh, Jesus is a, is a white guy. Or at least, you know, in the Bibles, I saw Jesus was a white guy. I, now that I know a little bit more about it, you know, I, I question even that. But the depictions that you see in the Bible are of Jesus as a white man. And if you believe that, and, and, I, and the only reason why I can share this with you is because this is what happened to me as a multi-generational survivor. Does that mean every single one of my ancestors all went to hell? Does that mean every single person that I've ever known to love and adore and to cherish is unworthy? As a 14-year-old indigenous kid. How do you think I felt about the church after that? And how do you think I acted, when, especially when you're in your 13, 14, 15? I mean, you're crazy in those times anyway. But And do you think I ever came into trouble with the law during that time? By the time I was 15 years old, 13 of my, 15, my 16 aunts and uncles were dead. Two of them we had found and picked up. My aunt is one of the murdered and missing women. Those are some of the multi-generational impacts. And even though I grew up in hell, that's what I always say to everybody, I grew up in hell. I'm not going to tease you, I grew up in hell. I would have never in all that time, I knew that my cousins that had been apprehended grew up in worse hell. Because even though our parents had no clue how to parent, and there was violence, and there was alcohol, and there was all of the other things that you hear about, I always knew my parents loved me. I was never a charity case. I was never a, a burden that came on them. I was always a blessing. They didn't know what the heck to do with me because I didn't have the skills to parent, but I was always a blessing. And so my life is really, really different from somebody who ended up in care, which most of my siblings did. And I can tell you that there were, their lives were way worse than mine because they didn't even have as much as love. And so they get into interactions with the law, that frustration, that angst, that disconnect, all of those things more than we do. And nobody ever recognizes that we have these unique gifts. And so that's what we did with Reconciliation Canada. And so each of you, and I, and I don't normally share this way, but you're young enough yet that the way you practice, the way you view the world can potentially change the way I experience the law and I experience justice and I experience my interactions on those days and how my daughter experiences that because it's not safe for us. I'm a, I'm a survivor of sexual abuse. It took me three years going through the chief justice fellow in the country because they absolutely refused to charge the person that sexually abused me even though there was over a hundred other cases that stemmed from him. Because they said, if we charge everybody that abuses Aboriginal kids in these communities, our jails are going to be full. So it took me three years going through the court system, trying to even get that case pushed through. From the police officer, to the district dude, to the provincial dude, to the national dude. And I could tell you all those things when I was going through it, but that was a long time. And that was my experience on this end of justice. And then, as I mentioned, having all of those other experiences growing up. 
But what we do with Reconciliation Canada and what we talk about with Reconciliation Canada has to do with changing those perceptions. It has to do with recognizing that we're all one, with recognizing that each of us has some gift that we can bring, that each of us, no matter where we come from, has love for our parents, for our children, for our grandchildren, if that's the case, for our cousins, for our aunties, for our uncles, that they're human beings in spite of that. I don't care if you're a drop-down drunk. I know what happened to him when he was young. I'd be a drunk too if that happened to me, if that was my lot in life, if I faced the same things that he faced. I'm just really, really lucky. I'm just one of the lucky ones that my parents changed their lives young enough for me to be able to see a different way forward. That I had people that believed in me, that reached out to me when I was growing up and said, you can do this. You have something. I don't know what it, I mean, they never told me what it was, but you're special, you're precious. I'm one of the lucky ones that got to hear that and live that while I was growing up. Many of our children never hear that even to this day. And they're so disconnected. All they ever hear is the negativity and the frustration and the anger, knowing I experienced this. I remember one time I was, I was in, um, I was a president of the American Indian Science and Engineering Society. You guys are all college, most of you are college students now. And so we had the top, and, and this was back in the day when there, I probably had, 12 of the total of 15 First Nations science students across the country with me in these two vans going down to this American Indian Science and Engineering Conference. Our first big thing, we all had our nice clothes on. We were all, you know, having fun driving around in the van going down there. You know, it was professional. We got the top floor suites with all the seeing around because, you know, they're trying to recruit you into all of these places. So they treat you really, really. First store we pulled up. Too. We all got out because, you know, we needed a pee break. We'd coming from UBC and, and we got so far and, and we pulled over and the guy got all his friends out from behind the thing because we were all Indian and called the police because there was too many Indians in the store and asked us to step outside and only allow a maximum of three of us in the store at the same time. That's like a regular experience. I remember being at UBC and going to one of the communities out here, um, uh, doing some lectures up in, up in one of the larger cities. I won't name the city, but it's northern city. <coughs> and um, <coughs> I was a, uh, what do you call it? One of those, I don't know what it is. It's like an adjunct professor. You're not really a professor, but you have professor status, you know? and. Uh, Something like that, a little, a little more, because I was, I was like embedded in the institution. Sessional is more in and out, kind of for special occasions. I was like embedded in there. And so I made this, this reservation over the phone. Uh, I'm from UBC, bill it to this account, blah, blah, blah. Oh, we have a nice room for you, no problem. I called 10 minutes before I got there because I didn't really know where I was going. Oh, everything's set. I walked in the door and they said, oh, I'm sorry, we don't have any rooms available anymore. Uh, you'll have to go to the hotel down the street. This wasn't that long ago. Um, and, and so there, and my father experiences all, all the time as well. So there are issues that we experience, but we, we, people are kind of in denial. That doesn't happen in our country. And I'm getting off, I'm getting off task here, but I think it's really important that we recognize what actually goes on today, because I think Ignorance is bliss, but it's also dangerous. It's dangerous for me. I can tell you it was dangerous for my cousin. I can tell you it was dangerous for my aunt. Five years before that happened with, with the Picton pig farm, we had told the police that she had gone with Robert Picton to the farm. That was the last place that we saw her. The police didn't do anything until a Caucasian physician who had adopted an Indian girl went to the police saying, my daughter is missing. 
and that's when everything within, I think it was within a year they had all of the, all of those women, the case was done up. Um, and so your role in justice and in criminology is going to be really, really important. And you're going to be challenged, especially any of you that want to go into family law. Trying to do the right thing and to uphold the virtues of family law and to restore families and to build community when the laws are the way they are right now. When we have a law that says you must report any incidents of physical abuse that you hear, what do you do? Or you're going to go to jail. <laughs> what do you do? Even though, as I told you, most cases of physical abuse, the child would rather be with the parents. And so I think the idea of restorative justice, allowing us different options, allowing us a way to not just restore people to community. I, I'm always of two minds on this, because I think restorative justice in the right way is a brilliant concept. And I think, like anything else, there's some really smart, uh, unsavory people out there who like to use restorative justice for their own ends. But I think that the vast majority of Aboriginal people in our communities the vast majority, I would argue 95% of people who are currently incarcerated are incarcerated because of something, some minor infraction or some, what do you call it, got drunk, snapped just for a minute, generally out of character. We, we already have that idea that I'm a bad person anyway, so you cop to it even though somebody else would say, oh, I'm gonna call my dad, we'll get a lawyer, and I know to keep my mouth shut. We already have those things in our mind. So we've already done something wrong just by virtue of being who we are. And so you'll, 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 what you believe comes true. And I think one of the things that we can do with Reconciliation Canada is really bringing together people from justice, from law, from health, from education, from politics, from industry, from every walk of life to come together to talk about how do we build community? How do we find creative ways like restorative justice, like dialogue circles that recognizes our unique attributes, our unique skills, and build something better than we could before? My counterpart in Reconciliation Canada, it's hilarious. I'm a, my background is health. I'm a science geek by, by trade, but I'm, but I'm a creative thinker by uh, purpose. And my counterpart is a um, chartered accountant uh, with 15 years at senior management at one of the top four chartered accountant firms in the country. So on to being partner. Uh, which means she has all of those really technical skills that nobody ever really likes to talk about. She's brilliant. She couldn't have done Reconciliation Canada. I couldn't have done Reconciliation Canada. But together, we were able to combine those really unique skill sets based on the values of Namwayut, understanding, dignity, and hope and bring together over 70,000 people along with Dr. Bernice King to the city of Vancouver within eight months. From zero to that day with eight months, no money, no, no organization, no anything because of those values-based beliefs and because of that fundamental understanding that each of us brings something unique to the table. And the idea being that we don't have to agree with one another. Remember, Namwayut doesn't mean we all think the same, act the same, do the same, are the same. It means we are allowed to be our unique selves and contribute in our unique way into the social fabric, to a vibrant social fabric that allows us to then lift up society as a whole. How many of you here consider yourself Canadians? What does that mean to you? I'm getting bored of hearing myself talk. We well, apologize a lot. We apologize. We're a very, we're a very kind, we're a very considerate society, right? What else does it mean? 
Canadians. If you're going to another word, do you use a US flag or do you use a Canadian flag on your backpack? Why? Because we're peaceful, we're embracing. We like to be, we're, we're kind of like the uh, UN of, of worlds, right? We, we, we appreciate diversity, we, we, we love justice, we believe in equality and, and all of those great things. That's what being a Canadian means, or at least it used to mean. And I think one of the biggest things that has brought people together under Reconciliation Canada is we see ourselves that way and we recognize that somewhere along the line in the past 10 or 15 years, we've kind of gone astray. We've kind of lost value of that because of the, the meltdown in finances and all of those other things. But it also created a little bit of an equal, uh, it leveled out the playing field a little bit more. And so, our challenge at Reconciliation Canada is if you are a Canadian, if I am a in a woman, if I am the eldest daughter of Chief Robert Joseph, if I am the children of Dr. Liz Elliott, what does that mean? If I am a hummingbird, what does that mean? What special gifts, because we're never going to be like our parents, even though we love and adore our parents, I'm never going to be like my father. That's just not my skill set. I could work until I'm, I'll just never be like him. But I'm really special all on my own. And I can do this along with my friends. Together we can create something magnificent. So our challenge to you at Reconciliation Canada is to think about who you are as a Canadian. And if you really believe in those values as a Canadian, what is your responsibility to make sure they happen? If you, if you look at the video by, by Dr. Bernice King, justice does not happen by chance. Equality does not happen on its own. It's a fight that we engage in. It's a conversation that we engage in every, every day. It's a challenge. But more importantly, it begins first with us. In addition to namwayut, there's another word that we use, and that's nakalkala. If you really, truly believe that we are God's gift, we are a gift of the creator, of creation, and creation I, I don't usually talk like this. I, I try to keep out of the whole spiritual realm, but I'm in that space with you guys right now, so I'm just going to go with it. I usually use different words to kind of tone down that piece of, of who I am. But one of the things I had to tell myself how I came out of that thing was God doesn't make junk. I'm a woman, and I'm not one of those fuzzy, cuddly, giggly, laughy kind of women. I'm a woman that sort of exists in my brain. I like to puzzle. I like to have really deep one-on-one -on -one meaningful conversations with the very few friends that I have. You know, that's just me. I, you know, when I'm thinking, I look like this, you know. My dad used to always say to me when I was a kid, fix your face. Like, there's nothing wrong. <laughs> like, I'm not angry. I'm not any. I'm just thinking really, really hard. I'm not one of those women. I'm really, really different that way. You know, we all have these visions of who we want to be or who we ought to be, but the reality is, is the hardest part is accepting who we are and just running with it and just living that gift that we've been given. And so the other part of, of Namwayut is Nakalkala. Reconciliation begins with that inward journey. Who am I? If I'm a Canadian, who am I? If I'm a part of my family, who am I? What do I bring to my family? What do I bring to the interactions of the people around me? How do I want to show up? Because I can guarantee you, if you're in these rooms, every one of you is going to be a leader. Just by virtue of where you are. You're already in the top realms of where you are by being in this room. How do you want to show up as a leader? And how can you then figure out how you carry your values and how you project that into the world? And how, because that's how reconciliation begins. When you talk about that circle, 
You talk about that big circle in the sky. It's hard to make those circles. It's hard to hold those circles. Because what happens if one person doesn't really believe and they step back? What happens to the circle if you cut it? It just flies apart, right? It's like its own tension. And if you cut that circle, if somebody believes in those circles, that they're not a part of Namliyut, then we don't have a circle. And so that's our responsibility as individuals, is looking at how does that apply in our lives? How do we show up in our best way every day? You know how you have those really, really grumpy days? It's like, I'm tired, I've got a test tomorrow, I'm bored. How do you want to show up, though, with your friendships? And that's what Nakaukala and Namuyut are about. That's what all my relations really means, is how do I want to show up today, and how do I remember to show up in that way and challenge myself to show up in that way every day? So it's a lot of, it's a lot of words, but I keep thinking about this idea of a new way forward in, in correctional practice. And the only way we're going to get any kind of a new way forward is if we start thinking differently about ourselves first and foremost and finding out who we are, what are our values, what are our skills, and how do we want to use them to create stronger communities. Because every one of us is going to do it differently. And somehow we have to find and create systems that allow us to do it differently together through restorative justice is one way, one very important way of doing that, that models some of the values we've talked about here today. But not everybody's going to embrace those values. And my challenge to you here today is to look inside yourselves and ask yourselves, what are the values you bring? And how do you live them every day? Because ultimately, that's who people are going to see you as. That's how they're going to experience you. And that's the impact. It's not what you think about yourself. It's how I experience you. How do people experience you on a daily basis? And how can you make sure that the way you act or you interact with somebody reflects the way you want to be seen in the world? And that is the hardest challenge. That's how you achieve inner peace, by being who it is you really want to be. And that's how you get involved with reconciliation. Reconciliation means first I must reconcile with who I am because I can't imbue that upon you. I can't heal you and make you reconciled. I must first bring that to a conversation. Those wonderful conversations around the kitchen table, that really changes us. I, this really means a lot to me because of my family background, because of my own experiences. I've just touched into what those means to me. I was up all night last night. I can usually do these things, you know, here's my flow chart and everything. So thank you for your patience, for listening, and I'm open to any questions. Hechka.